Hi, welcome to another episode of Recover Loud. I'm your host, Mike Paddleford, and I recover loud. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life and recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people. People, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense i'm proud to say that i recover loud i never thought i could but i'm so proud that i discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny i needed recovery i still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. i recover loud here to tell my own story i recover proud save a life of like 40 i recover loud yeah i recover loud i recover I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud, I recover loud, here to tell my own story, I recover proud, save a life of like 40, I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud, I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud, I recover, 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 I recover loud. Hi, welcome to this episode of Recover Loud. Today's guest is Courtney DeBay from Presque Isle, Maine. Yeah. Uh, Courtney, welcome. Uh, thanks for sharing your, your uh, story with us. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like for little Courtney growing up? <laughs> um, it was okay um, until a little later, um, probably about 10. I had an abusive stepmom and my dad worked all the time she didn't like my mother so therefore my mom was not really around at that time so that was interesting yeah um and was that physical abuse yeah yeah um and did you feel like your dad knew about it um sometimes but i also knew that he worked a lot and um didn't really know the details i guess of that and we were all too young to really tell him what was happening yeah um, so at 10 years old, how did you, how did you deal with that? Um, well, I wanted my mom and she wasn't there and, um, so that was hard. And when I was able to go to my mom's house, I didn't want to ever go home after. Yeah. But, yeah. So what was it like in school for you? Hard. <laughs> Although that was my escape from my reality at that time. Yeah. So they divorced, um, and we moved to Ashland my freshman year of high school, and I started high school there, and that's when it took a turn. That's when I experimented with alcohol and weed and pills and... It was that, that was your freshman year? Yeah. Now, had you known anybody in, in Ashland at the time, or were you... Not really, no. Yeah. Um, so what did it look like, uh, you know, when you were using and drinking? Uh, was it a small group of people? Were they, you know, the big school parties? What was that? Uh, yeah, school parties on the weekends. Nice. Um, I met a group of kids when I first moved up there. Um, got in a relationship with one of them, and it was like a party scene every weekend. And it was fun. And now, was that strictly alcohol and, and weed, or was that...? Uh, yeah, but it... Um, I was offered pills a few times, and I took it, and I liked it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, do you remember what that experience, what was it doing for you? Um, I didn't have to think about reality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything that I had went through up to that point and, um, you know, starting a new school took all the anxieties away from that. So were you able to graduate from, from high school or not? No, I did not. I dropped out three months before graduation. And what led to that? Um, I was pregnant with my oldest son and ended up having complications with that and I didn't go back. Yeah. Um, so as your pregnancy progressed, did you continue using? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so what eventually happened with, with your first pregnancy? Um, so I had him and um, 
my addiction after I had him is like when it really took off. It was more than just like the parties on the weekends and um, I knew that I wasn't able to provide him a good life. So I brought him to my grandparents' house and left him in the middle of the night when he was three months old. And how old were you then? I was, I was just turned 18. You left him with your grandmother, yep. knowing that he would probably have a better chance. Yeah, be safe. Mm -hmm. And and what was your life like that you knew that that was a better option? Um, well, I was just partying all the time still. I knew that I had a problem that I couldn't get rid of on my own. Mm -hmm. And dragging him here, there, and everywhere. He needed a better life, and I knew that. That must be a very hard decision. Yeah. Um, and you know, people out there who have never experienced addiction um, probably can't grasp that right. concept. Um, but, you know, we always say in recovery, self-awareness and, you know, uh, gives us the power to, you know, identify what's going on with us right. and do something about it. But when we're in addiction and we have that awareness that this is not going well right. and I need to do something, um, you know, it's just, it's not something everybody does. Yeah. Um, so uh, thanks for sharing that as part of your story. Um, so what happened uh, after you went away and now you didn't have that responsibility? Um, it got, it went a lot deeper than what it ever had been. Um, mm -hmm. And actually that's when I found heroin because I knew that I did something, I knew it was right to do what I did so he didn't have to live that life. Um, but not knowing I guess why I had done that yeah. and the guilt from it. Um, yeah, so there was still some shame and guilt. Right. And yeah. Knowing that I couldn't do it, it bled down mm -hmm. when I died. Now, see, I actually um, have a similar experience with, uh, I had three children, mm -hmm. and I never got so I stayed high the entire time they were growing up. Uh, my daughter was 16 before I ever quit. Um, but my middle son, when he was a freshman, we lived in Massachusetts. And we were moving back to Maine because uh, in the previous three months I told four vehicles I couldn't work, I couldn't earn money, I couldn't survive in Massachusetts, so we had to come back to Northern Maine. Uh, but my son was on the basketball team and on the football team, and he wanted to stay. So, leaving him behind, I felt at the time he was, at, at least he was going to be out of there. Right. You know? um, and then what I later found out, you know, when my addiction turned and I couldn't afford to send money, when I stopped calling him all the time, uh, when he stopped texting me back, yeah. you know, I didn't, he was like my little buddy growing up, you know. Yeah. Uh, did you have any other children? Yes. Four years later, I had another boy, and then when he was three months old, I was already pregnant with another child, and so they were really close in age. Yeah. So what ended up happening with your other two children? Um, well, I was a functioning addict, as, you know, we all kind of believe to be. Right. Until... You're not anymore, mm -hmm. and um, DHS stepped in and took them in 2018. And how old were the kids? Then? Three or four. Okay. Um, so, do you feel like they remember um, life with you at that age before yes. they? Yeah. yeah. And you said eventually um, the desire to be reunited is what led you to to right. Yeah. End. Yeah. Um, so, what does that relationship look like today? It's good. It's very good. Um, it's nothing that I would have pictured it entering mm. rehab. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, it's good. I have them twice a week and every other weekend, and um, things are good. And you mentioned they're in foster care. Yes. And do you have a relationship with, with the yeah, foster care? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, she is like my best friend, and um, for us it's, not, it's never been like a fight. Um, we do all holidays together, we do birthday parties together, we do, you know, the kids were just away on vacation and, you know, we all hung, we hung out and went to shopping and out to eat. And, yeah. so we don't choose to go to rehab when things are going well for us, right. or seemingly going well. Yeah. Um, so what was going on in your life at that time that made you decide finally to get some help? Um, after losing my two youngest, at first it was very, like I knew that they were safe and it wasn't really a problem until it really hit me. And instead of using every day to feel the like physical dependence mm -hmm. that we all, you know, that I had on it, um, it was like using to die, like just hopes that yeah. one of those times it would be the end.
Yeah. Um, did you ever try to commit suicide? Um, using, yes, yeah. and was not successful. Yeah. And, you know, it was the same way for me. I didn't want to kill myself. Right. I didn't want to die. Um, but I didn't feel like life was worth living. Yeah. Um, Just you know. want the pain to go away. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, however, you know, I accepted I was going to die as a, hero, as a heroin addict. Yeah. And I knew that that would probably take me. Yeah. Um, and every day I waited. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't have, you know, taken a gun to my head. Right. Um, but I really wished it would just happen. Yeah. You know? That's where I was. Yeah. Um, and had you had any overdoses? No. Not up to that. Um, up to that point, no. Mm -hmm. I, I can understand, you know, once your kids were taken away, you didn't want to live anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and you just use as much as it would take to feel yeah. better, numb out, or as, probably as much as you could afford. Yeah. Absolutely, and um, just being where we are today, that was never, I never seen that, so that's enough. Yeah, and you know, um, it, it's funny that we always think we know what we want, right. and what it's going to look like when we get it, right. you know, um, and then a lot of times we realize we've got what we want, it just doesn't look the same. Right, you yeah. Know? And so that relationship with your kids, it's not exactly the way you pictured it. It's exactly. not the end goal. Exactly. But for now, it's something. Right. You know, so, um, you know, I'm glad you get that opportunity yeah. and that, you know, you're using that. Um, you know, today it's almost five years in and mm -hmm. it took a while, but uh, he called us. I, it was two, almost a year and a half ago now. He came back from Japan after being over there six months. He ended up meeting a girl online, got out, she moved in with him, and uh, they got married, they eloped. And he's like, I'm done being mad at you guys. I want you to meet my wife. I want you to be part of our lives. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, I see you're doing well. Yeah. Um, and that's what I tell parents today. It's like, you know, don't <coughs> think that, you know, DHS has got this pile of shit that you need to do yeah. and you're yeah. never gonna get it done. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Yeah. You've got a pile of shit that you need to do. Yeah. yeah. Keep doing that. Yeah. And then either they're going to see it and allow you, your kids, or later on your kids are exactly. going to be like, I'm yeah. just doing good. Exactly. You know? And they're going to want to reach out. Yeah. What position are you going to be in when they do? You might not get him back, but maybe he'll come back when he's old enough. Right. You know, you might not yeah. raise him, but you might have him in your life when he's 18. Yeah. You know, but, you know, it's just... Somebody says something and you're like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And uh, I've done a lot of things I'm not happy about, you know, or with, but yeah. there's nothing that uh, I'm ashamed of still today, though. Yeah. Because I did what we did. You yeah. can't take it back. No, and if you live with that shame, there's never any, you know, growing or healing from that either. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's where the growth comes from. When yeah. we can look at ourselves talk about it, share it with other people, and it doesn't make us cry, right. it doesn't make us hate ourselves, it doesn't yeah. make us, mm -hmm. you know, feel like we did then. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then we know we've grown a little bit. Yeah. Right. You know, and I think it's important that we acknowledge it too. Yeah. You know, and all the time, it's those little things. Yeah. If you paused before you said what you were about to say and yeah. said it differently, Saved well, myself a lot of heartache in life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I had to learn how to accept myself for who, who I am. Yeah. You know, I'm not leader. Um, yeah. I'm not in control. You know, uh, I drove the car into the ditch every time I had the wheel. Yeah. You know, um, so learning that lesson and you know learning that I don't have to control the world. 
Right. Um, you know, I don't have to decide what somebody else is doing yeah. or if they're doing it right. It's on them. Yeah. You know? Either they're going to get it or they're not. And, you know, I have no personal stake in that. Right. So letting that go and just worry about me and knowing that I don't have to do everything right and perfect every time. Yeah. You know? And you had mentioned before that um, you weren't religious going into this program. Right. <laughs> so what did it take for, for this program to really um, kick your, in for you? Well, your encounter with Jesus, mm -hmm. your first one. Um, when I got there, I thought that people were crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I thought it was all crazy until I had my first interaction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, reading the Bible, I never understood a word that it was saying. <laughs> right. So it took a while for that, too. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get it, it, there's no turning back. Right. And um, that's a lengthy program. Oh, yes. And uh, you said you graduated. How long were you there? Twelve months. Twelve months. Mm -hmm. um, my program was a six to nine month program, and I got kicked out yeah. after three months. Um, and mine wasn't. Mine, mine was a tough program. Mm -hmm. uh, milestone rehab in Old Orchard Beach. Uh, you know, up to sixteen men living in one place together, learning to live um, in harmony. Yeah. <laughs> with 16 strangers uh, dealing with your triggers every day and not wanting to, you know, not being able to reach out right. uh, for a substance. Um, and you were, you were, um, you were able to grab on to the Bible mm -hmm. and, you know, learn things about your life and about, uh, you know, life in general. Yeah. Um, is there anything that, that stands out to you that you've learned while you were there at the rehab? Versus. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that you have to actually pick one um, oh. shortly after you get there, mm -hmm. and actually I picked it. And usually, like people will pick one, and then it changes as their sobriety and relationship with Jesus changes. But mine kind of stayed the same, still does. Yeah. So <laughs> as people grow, they right. learn something new. So what was the the verse that you chose? Second uh, Corinthians twelve nine. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Yeah. Um. Can you explain what that means for you? For me, um, well, when I had to pick it out in the beginning, it was like, you know, when we are weak, he is strong. And then I have just kind of carried that with me the whole time. Because yeah. not every day is easy. No. <laughs> you know, we think we get sober and life is just going to be okay. And mm -hmm. it's not, but it's still the same today as it was three and a half years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and the only difference is, is we're not reaching for something to, right. to get away from it. Right. Uh, we have to go through it. We have to feel it. Right. And I don't know about you, but, you know, I did these things so I wouldn't have to feel. Right. Um, you know, so not having that option or not choosing to, to go that route now, you know, sometimes can be, it, it can make life seem heavy. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, I do, I, I do believe in Jesus and God and um, it took me a while. I, I didn't. I didn't want to go that route. Um, you know, when I went to rehab and started going into the 12-step programs and they started talking about a higher power, I thought I was doomed. Yeah. Because the, I would never accept it. Yeah. Um, and then a walk on the beach down at Old Orchard, standing there watching the waves come in, and, you know, they were getting closer and closer to my feet, and I was just noticing how big the world actually is. Yeah. You know, compared to the view that I had before I went to rehab, you know, sitting in my room, looking through the crack in the blinds, yeah. into the woods, you know, everything seemed so small and, yeah. you know, closed in. And here I was just looking out and, I mean, I could see forever, it seemed. Um, you know, so that, it came over me and I ended up dropping to my knees in the water in November yeah. and I started to cry. And I didn't know how to pray. I'd never done that. Yeah. Um, but I knew that I was grateful for being alive. That I had never harmed my kids in a way. Or my family. Um, and that they were still on this earth. Um, and that I'd never, you know, done anything too horrible. You know? Um, but I knew that it wasn't my doing. Right. You know? Because I did everything possible to take all that away. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, you know, just giving um, some credit, 
you know, to where the credit was due. And in that moment, you know, that's what I felt. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was a changing moment for me in, in my recovery. Um, I was able to start accepting things. I was able to start putting things down that weren't mine to carry. Yeah. You know, um, and, and not feeling all that pressure, yeah. you know. Um, so when you got out, you said not everything's perfect. Right. Um, what do you do uh, to handle stress today? Um, well, I still go to church on Sundays, and I still read my Bible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there it's very structured, and you're, um, and I've kind of carried that with me, mm -hmm. you know, two and a half years since leaving there, so. Yeah, and that's, that's another point, too, you know, when it's structured and we have to do things yeah. this way, you know, um, you know, but characters shown when we do things when nobody else is looking. Right. You know. Um, and taking care of ourselves, knowing that we have these problems yeah. and that we have a solution that we can turn to, yeah. you know. So what's next for you? What are your plans for the future? Um, well, hopefully one day sooner than later I will be working with people in recovery. That is ultimately the goal. Yeah. If I could give any advice to the person still struggling today, it would be that you are not your current situation. You are not the things that you've done. There is a God who loves you and will set you free. All you have to do is surrender. Well, thanks for sharing all that with us. This season of Recover Loud is presented by Recovery on the Road, a Facebook group providing recovery support and resources to anyone, anywhere, at any time throughout the day. If you or someone you know is struggling, please connect to Recovery on the Road on Facebook. Recovery on the Road has been offering in-person meetings here at 46 Sweeten Street in Caribou. If you're in the area, please stop by, grab a calendar, and come attend one of the meetings. We believe that connection is the opposite of addiction. Recover loud, everyone. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life in recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense i'm proud to say that i recover loud i never thought i could but i'm so proud that i discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny i needed recovery i still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. i recover loud here to tell my own story i recover proud save a life of like 40 i recover loud yeah i recover loud i recover loud yeah I recover loud, I recover loud, here to tell my own story I recover proud, save a life of like 40 I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud I recover, I recover loud Hi, I'm Mike Paddleford, the host of Recover Loud I'm sitting here with my friend Marshall Mercer Together, we've recently started a new show called Crying Out Loud Marshall Mercer, I'm an organizer, I'm an activist, so I'm an advocate, um, owner of my own company, CSK Services, Recovery Services, I'm executive director of Hope Brokers Incorporated. But six years ago, I was in prison. Um, ten years before that, I was addicted to needles. So um, before that, I was I was in crime. I was a dealer. Mm -hmm. I, I was a gang member. I was all these other things that nobody knew of me to be today. So. Marshall, tell us a little bit about what this new show is going to be about. So this show is going to be about, it's going to be a, a place where um, the people who are unhoused can come speak their power as a truth. Um, it's going to be a place where the marginalized community can come together and um, be themselves and be able to tell us what is going on with them, give us the, the needs that they need so we can help them. Um, more along the lines, we can always come to find if we listen to our people, they will have the solutions right there with them. Yeah, because everyone has ideas of who they believe is out there on the street, um, who is out there struggling, and why. When we get to talk to um, people, regardless of where they are um, in their journey um, and who they are, we get to know the people behind the yeah. images. You know, we can drive up and down the street. Uh, we're shooting the show in Augusta. Yes. Uh, we're going to be focusing on people who are, are struggling here in Augusta. Um, 
and we see it. You know, drive down the street, you see it. Um, we can assume anything we want about those people, but it doesn't do them any good. You know, uh, learning who they are, finding out why they're there, uh, finding out what it's going to take to bring them up out of that. You know, and who knows better uh, than the people who are in it. And that's the thing too. A lot of times, it's not because they're using drugs. Uh, it's not because we're out here on um, uh, doing crime or because we um, did something in our past lives or anything. Some mm -hmm. of us may have lost our jobs or yeah. um, may have um, gotten a car accident, um, got hurt, injured somehow, yeah. lost their wives. I mean, X, Y, Z, mental health. It's yeah. not always on um, black or white. There's no more people on the show that come on the show that's going to make you, each and every one of you think about who these people are. Think about who you are. Um, biases. Mm -hmm. I know I have many of biases. So I can come out here and I could choose to love or choose to bring my anger or choose mm -hmm. to do any other things. But when we choose just to love, man, every mm -hmm. time, I mean, when you get to know each and every one of these individuals, you get to know the names, you get to know who they are as a, yeah. a human. And we don't think of people as a house or at all. Uh, drug addicts or any of the names that we want to give people we think we're messing with. Yeah. Point, point, point. yeah you know, they were, I spent a time, uh, you know, without a home, living in my car. Mm -hmm. And my daughter used to, you know, call me every night. She was worried. And she's like, Dad, you're homeless. And mm -hmm. I said, no, I'm without an address. I like that. At the moment, I didn't have an address. I knew that was something that gave me a goal. You know, I would work towards getting an address. You know, um, so just identifying that and, you know, not putting that negative spin on everything. You know, we, we can help the people out there today and, uh, you know, they can help us by letting us know what they need. Absolutely. I like to um, leave us with this. Unhoused people deserve to live too. Absolutely. <laughs>